everybody to another bioassessment webinar. I'm going to be talking for about, I'm shooting for about 40 minutes of material. I'll try to leave a fair amount of time for questions for anybody who has them. I'm going to be, I should say that I'm going to be covering quite a bit in a short amount of time here. So there's a lot of, a lot of detail that I won't get to, but at the end of the presentation, there's a link to the recent report that was just posted on the SWAMP website that uh, describes a lot of what I'm going to be covering in more detail. Of course, you're always welcome to contact me directly. So with that, let's get started. So what I've decided to do is break this presentation up into about four sections. I'll spend a few minutes talking about the background on why why this type of a survey was initiated in the first place and, and what we think they, they have in water quality monitoring and management. And then I'll, I'll spend the section just giving a technical overview of how the process works, and how, the, how the design works, and how the, uh, the collection efforts work. And I'll uh, spend some time to giving some highlights of, from the recent report describe some of the things that happened in the first eight years of the project, and close with uh, just a little overview of what we're working on now as we lead into the next the next uh, phase. Let's start start here with a need for why is this in the first place. I like to probably these surveys in general in the United use in the United States started in the late 1980s, a part of an outgrowth of frustration in U.S. Congress that despite spending billions of dollars on a water quality monitoring, the EPA still wasn't able to answer or they felt were basic questions about the nation's aquatic resources. So questions like what's the, what is the condition of the nation's waters? And is it getting better? Is it getting worse? And are, are we allocating our, our dollars wisely? And it was after this frustration or this need that the EPA's Office of Research and Development developed um, the, the, the probability survey method that we use for our perennial streams assessment. So the environmental, the EPA's uh, program they developed was called the Environmental Monitoring and Assessment Program, or EMAP, as it's a strategy for optimizing the use of monitoring resources to answer those some of those top-level questions. The basic idea is you use a, a probability survey to, to select sites and allows you, uh, so each site represents a known stream length with known statistical precision, and that that's the heart of this. It's what allows us to make assessments for a large resource with limited sampling effort. Once your sites and you sample them um, for a lot of biological, chemical, and physical data, and then analyze those data to make um, objective statements. Like, uh, for example, 49% of California streams have degraded invertebrate assemblages, um, or 76% of biologically degraded North Coast streams are also degraded by fine sediments. So it's that type of statement that we can make with these surveys. The last, the last step in the process is going from those types of assessments use the information to help interpret the existing monitoring data and to guide the management of monitoring resources. So that's the that's a, a big focus of the Water Board's effort right now, is taking the, the facts from these surveys and, and uh, really integrating into what the Water Boards do, how they do their work. So I've got a couple slides just to show you conceptually what, what we're doing and why we're doing it. I like to a distribution of, if you think of any, a distribution of any monitoring data, maybe it's uh, mercury levels or fine sediment or biological conditions, something like that. For any of these things, if we collect data from our our monitoring sites, we create a distribution of what the, the values of those look like. And, you know, we might have before or after data at a given site represented here by A and B. This might be two different sites that we want to compare. And generally compare them with respect to the monitoring data that we have, the distribution of that. But in fact, the monitoring data that 
we collect typically are a subset of the full distribution of, of data that are potentially out there. And what we're, so if you think about this, the, the, um, this distribution in gray here, this represents the overall distribution for that parameter. And so, um, and if you add further, add uh, another, another targeted distribution of the high quality sites, we know perspective for how to interpret the values of A and B a little bit better, or actually a lot better. Um, so take, for example, well, if you think about this example here, um, your impressions of the difference between A and B might be uh, quite different if it looked uh, like this. So no, the, the point here is that knowing the, the true distribution or the overall distribution can help us in context for interpreting our, our local monitoring data. Now, the, the value here is what our probability surveys do is they give us that overall distribution and they do it in a, a unbiased way. So these statistical surveys, um, much like since we're in the election season again, you know, these are just like political polls that allow us to estimate you know, the characteristics of a large population like all the streams in California, a relatively small sampling effort. Um, and the knowledge of that distribution that allows us to produce objective estimates of the extent of our resources and the condition of those resources with known amounts of error. So that allows us to make statements like I showed before that 49 plus or minus 5% of California streams have degraded biology. These, so these surveys, these probability surveys, they started out uh, in the late 80s and early 90s and um, back east working on acid rain programs and since been widely adopted throughout the U.S. So a number of uh, federal programs use them and about 35 states are currently using probability surveys in some form of water quality programs. Um, we've been in them, as Eric said, since 2000, so we've got about 12 years of data. Uh, these are for a lot of different resources as well, not just rivers and streams, but for wetlands, lakes, coastal basins, and estuaries, and other things as well. So that's, that's sort of the tech, that's the, the overview bit. The, I'll talk a minute here about how we sort of we are in the, the timing of this. The Western work, our work in California, began with an EMAP project called WEMAP, or the Western EMAP pilot, which was a, a four-year sampling effort across the 12 Western states. California was uh, lucky to get a couple special intent areas of intensification. We got uh, had about 200 sites in California collected over those four years, and with a, a lot of sites collected in the North Coast and the South Coast. We had some additional sites in the Central Coast at the, in the last year. So the, the EMAP program is shown in the box on the left. As that program was wrapping up, the State Water Board, working with EPA Region 9, developed a follow-up program called CMAP, which was very similar to EMAP, except that it added the ability to make statements about land use or make assessments relative to major land use uh, and land cover classes in the state. And that program ran from 2004 to 2007. And, and um, as it ended, the swamp program picked up then, and it became uh, known as the perennial streams assessment, which is what we call it now. So the PA has built on these previous designs and added more refinement, more indicators, um, some design enhancements. And now all three of these projects are referred collectively as PSA. So. I'll try to talk about these not as EMAP or CMAP and PSA, but all as PSA. So this 
project we're going to be talking about, um, let's see, we're talking about the first eight years, which are these two, two bits here. Okay. So the next several slides, of, I want to present some technical overview about the survey design itself and, uh, and how it works and how we pick a random representative sample and how we score the biology. So there's, there's a, a bit of uh, technical stuff there. There are some links here to resources that should help if you have additional questions. And of course, as I said, I'll be always happy to, to talk about them in, in, uh, afterwards. So let's let's start here. The way the way this approach works, and again we've drawn heavily from the EPA. In fact, relied uh, on them for helping us with generate these, these designs. Uh, Tony Olson and uh, Don Stevens are the primary people there. A step in the process is to define the the resource that you want to say something about. So the population of interest. Thus, it's all perennial weightable stream. And that, that work then is what we call the sampling frame. So for us, that we uh, derive from the National Hydrography data set, uh, so NHD. This is the medium resolution version, so 1 to 100K. And that's the basis for our, that's the frame we use for our survey. This is the step in the process. Once you define your universe, is to select a geographically balanced set of sites from that network. And the process is, uh, there's a lot of papers on this. If you're interested, it's called a Gertz design, or uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's, uh, def it just defines how you pick sites from a complicated network, like a stream network. I'll give you a, just a quick overview here. The, the process works is you take that, Network, and you you convert it all into a line by taking all the segments in the watershed or in local watershed and basically string them out and putting them end to end until you've got one really long line that represents the straight stream network. All the segments have um, network IDs, and so the, a number code that goes with each of those. We keep the, the length of the stream uh, uh, as it was originally, and then we go through a process um, called reverse hierarchical ordering to randomize it, and in a way that keeps it spatially balanced. Essentially, um, we raise not the picking of the points, but the um, movement of the stream segments on the line. This example here, this this line here represents the the work of first, second, and third order streams converted into a line. So the next step then is to just we can place sampling locations systematically on that line and represent those locations or those points along the line, and then translate it back into geographic coordinates. So the Point five here represents that point on that stream. And we can do this because this is now, because now um, this line is arranged um, sequentially in a, uh, and it's graphically balanced. We can just pick points at regular intervals along that line, and we we know that we have a, a geographically balanced um, random sample. So one another interesting technical bit here. Think about a stream network like the one I showed here, or larger scale in California. Most stream length is typically small order, small streams like these first order headwater streams. So you can put a third order stream here. That's that's pretty typical. Um, if you look at this is a this is a plot of that in California. Your total stream length up here. Uh, first order streams represent most of the stream length in the state. By the time you get to third and fourth larger streams, 
there's very little stream length that they represent. The challenge with this is that if you just pick a simple random selection of sites, what we would do is we would have an assessment of first order streams in the state. And that's not really what we want. We want to have some balance um, about in that. We want to be able to make some, we have very imprecise uh, assessments for the larger streams, and that's not what we want. We want pretty good assessments across the whole uh, range of stream sizes. So the, the solution here is increase the probability of sampling large streams by increasing the relative segment length. And so if you think back to mine example, here's the original one, and here is the here is where we've adjusted the weight of the 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 chance that you'll get a site on a larger order stream simply by increasing the relative size of those stream lengths. You can do that as much as you want, you just need to know how much you made the adjustment, and then you do you back adjust at the end of the process uh, to compensate for that. So all together now, that process gives us a set of, of sites that are representative of the whole state. It gives us an objective representation, but it's also spatially balanced throughout the state, uh, which is that's a nice. Nice combination. It's a little challenging to do with something as complicated as a stream network. Um, the thing to keep in mind here is, is that because of this process we went through, each site is not, not equal in the assessment. So a, um, the amount of weight that each sampling site carries in the final assessment depends on uh, how uh, many sites there were for that stream class. In this example here, um, here's a network of first, second, third, fourth order streams. Um, we had samples on first order streams, um, and say there's 10,000 kilometers. Each site would represent about uh, 400 um, each. Um, for four order streams, there's a lot less stream. Two samples on it, so we divide that by that, and so each right here represents 30 kilometers of length. And so it's so each site in this design has um, not the same weight because of this process we go through, and that's something you have to correct for at the end. And that's the that's the sort of an old, quick and dirty version of how we do the how the design works. Next. Technique that I want to talk about is how we get to the, the um, how we get to scoring our sites or scoring conditions from our sites. So, a lot of screws, when the when the design process is done, we have a sample to draw. It's a big list now of sites that are candidates, potential sampling sites. So our field gets this list, and they spend most of the winter validating that site list with uh, desk work and then field reconnaissance. The, the county assessor's offices is now most of that's available online, unfortunately. Um, and then they obtain permits for sampling public sites and uh, attempt to get permission to visit private sites. And once you've got a uh, refined that list a bit, then they go to use field visits to evaluate sites and make a final decision about whether sites are going to be accessible and meet the criteria that we're after. So I'm jump back and Forth a big few slides down uh, between the typical parts and some of the, the results. I wanted to start with the first because it relates to what happens during the reconnaissance phase. I mentioned that, that there's there's a process of winnowing that candidate list down, and there are no reasons why a site might not uh, meet our criteria, or it might meet our criteria, but we can't sample it. The pie on the left here, um, statewide distribution of, of what happens to sites that we looked at. The largest proportion are what are called NT, which means non-target. Uh, in almost all cases, these are sites that were non-perennial streams. So network contains a lot of non-perennial stream length, and that's represented there. Another 
big reason why sites might be rejected is because of landowner denial. So we simply don't get permission to sample them. Um, the, the other big category here in blue is, is the targeted and sampled population. So that's what the assessments are based on. A couple, um, well, here, so here's a, a, another way of thinking about the perennial, non-perennial issue. So in California, like many states in the Southwest, the uh, framework that's mapped for the state consists of um, both perennial and non-perennial reaches. And the non-perennial portion can be huge. Um, you look at what, I'm, what you're seeing in this graph here is, uh, is pairs of sites and the, the proportion that are perennial versus non-perennial, perennial, perennial is in blue, uh, non-perennial in gray, the green represents large river perennial. Um, the two bars, the, the one that labeled NHD in each pair is the is uh, uh, NHD's assignment of whether a site is perennial or non-perennial. This uh, represents our field uh, estimates of what, uh, what proportion are perennial and non-perennial. Uh, what we found is that I think anybody who's worked with these stream maps knows there's a lot of inaccuracies in the uh, in maps themselves. And that's, that certainly was borne out in our survey. And we found that this, the degree to which this is a problem varies quite a bit from region to region. And it works in both directions. There are some the the perennial, uh, a lot more, a lot of sites are we found to be perennial that that, that uh, she considers non-perennial, and and vice versa. Especially in the, the southern portions of the state, a lot of things that are listed as, as perennial, in fact, not. So, fine. Um, but when we get through all this thing, we've got our targeted set of sites now. Now it's time for sampling. And SWAN has worked, uh, put up effort in the last seven or eight years now to develop standard methods for collecting biological, chemical, and habitat condition indicators. So we use those um, and have those data available for all of these sites now. There's a, just a, a short list of it. There's, there's details in this, but this is the overview version. Most of these indicators. Um, habit biological and chemical have been collected under all three programs uh, with a couple exceptions. We collected fish in the EMAP program. We have in the last several years. Um, and we added uh, wetland condition indicators, the CRAM program, um, in the last, the last set of the project. So, okay, so indicate we are interested in, we'll be working with integrating a lot of these over the next coming years. What I'm going to present today is, is almost entirely uh, focused on benthic macroinvertebrates. Our, it's our primary biological condition indicator for the state. We really like them, other than the fact that we're entomologists and think they're cool, is that there's a lot of information in in the bus sandwiches. These are they would be very diverse and abundant. We can have dozens to greater than more than 100 uh, benthic invertebrate species at a site, and sometimes many thousands of individuals per meter squared. So a lot of information, uh, a lot of diversity. And the the key is that they have unique preferences for different conditions, different microhabitats, um, both in physical sense, but also in terms of sensitivity to different stresses. So some are, some are sensitive pollutants, some are sensitive to metal, some are sensitive to sediments, etc. And that that diversity and diversity of response that allows us to infer condition from them. There are a lot of ways that people can take a, that a list of organisms 
organisms that we see at a site, to that list of benthic macroinvertebrates that we have identified from a site, and turn it into numbers. We need to, for we use this to define in biological integrity, we need to be able to turn that list of organisms into numbers that tell us something about condition. It is that we do that in a way that we're we're using increasingly in the state, and if you've been following along on the bioobjectives effort, this is probably the primary way that we train or score biological condition is called a predictive models or observed to expected models. I want to see the next few slides talking about how this process works, and it's, this is really the most complicated section of the presentation, so um, free to ask questions at the end if you want. There's, I can point you to some additional resources to, to look at also. So, effort is, the effort is quite simple. It's really what we're, what we're doing is looking at the list of species we see at a site and we're comparing it to the, the number of taxa that we expected to see at the site. The is in figuring out what you expect to see there. And that using predictive modeling techniques, and we're using data from reference sites, which are sites with low levels of human activity. If, you, um, if you're interested in, in more detail on that, there's an, a webinar I gave about a year and a half ago that's on the SWAMP website, um, describe how the state's reference condition program um, was did and how the process works. So, estimating E. <coughs> The process is is essentially a three-step process. So the first thing we do is we take this a big set of reference sites that we've that represent all the different stream types types in the state um, and also the state. And we the first step is to cluster them on biological similarity. So we've got these species lists at all these reference sites, and we the first thing we do is we group them according to biological how similar their biology is to each other. And there's a, a measure called break curtis similarity that we use. And these, these dendrams represent relationships between them, how similar each site is. So they are uh, closer together or the, where the lines connect closest out here represent sites that are similar biologically. Ones that are further apart where you have to go back, further back up the or tree to find the, the you know, to, to um, connect them are similar biologically. So these colors here represent groups of relatively similar sites that are similar biologically. And you do this in different ways. You can have you can do it uh, coarsely like this, where we have four classes, or you more finely here, where we have eleven classes. And there's some reasons why you might want to do it different ways. But that's the first step. So in the, I'm going to use a simple example here. Here we have four clusters, A, B, C, and D. So these are clusters of biologically similar sites, making nothing to do with where they are in the state at this point. So the step then is to, is to develop a model that will predict class membership for the new sites. And the way we do that, the first thing we do is we say, okay, I've got these clusters now. now. Are there environmental variables that um, explain them, that are related to them. So are they, is cluster A uh, like a hydration group? Is it, um, you know, a wet group? Uh, things like that. And so we throw into the modeling exercise a lot of different variables. So watershed size, geology, uh, geographic location, elevation, temperature, precipitation, uh, a suite Potentially, potential explanatory variable. And our models here then tell us which of these predictors match up with these clusters the best. Which ones predict which clusters you should belong to. So once we've got the relationships, then we use, um, we use it to tell us the ability that for each cluster that we would capture a given species. So now we're now we're getting down to the species level, saying um, what 
So let's follow this through. So we've got our output from our predictive model that says, if I go to a test site and I said it has uh, my test site has some similarity with cluster A and cluster B about, and that's, these numbers here are the probability that, that it's similar to that cluster, to my test site now. So it's mostly like A and B, maybe a little bit like C, and not at all like D. And then go to those clusters and say, okay, in cluster A, what's, what's the chance that I'm going to see this catasolite genus, spherula, in the cluster? What, what probability that I'm going to see it? It's 0.6, and so the chance that, that this, or the, the so that site was with 8.5. I simply multiply these to get a probability. This is what we call a probability of capture. The probability that I'm going to see that organism at this site, or that I should expect to see it, is 0.3. And I run those across all the different clusters, all the different clusters, and I get a probability um, that that genus would be found at that site if it's in reference condition of. Now, now what we do is we do that for all the species, and so, and so it's the so, and then just sum the probabilities of capturing these different taxa. And I'm no longer by seeing them, I no longer care about them individually. All I care about is the count. So I expect to see there's a I expect to see four zero seven taxa at that site. And if I go to site and I observe uh, these axis ones represent the, the organisms that were observed, there are four, but one of them wasn't expected to be there. In this case, um, Hyla. Um, so it doesn't count the oh, you're the observed to expected ratio. Then and it's just three divided by 4.07, and that's 0.74, and that is our score. So where then is, is that ratio of the number of taxa I expected to see divided by the number of taxa that I saw. And it's, it's, it runs on a scale of 0 to 1. You can go over 1, but 1 represents the mean of, of uh, sites in, in reference condition. It represents the proportion of, you can think of it this way, as the proportion of native organisms present at a site. So, last bit here. So now I've got my biological condition scores. Now it's time to score. Now it's time to put this uh, to use this to score biology from our probability survey. So what you see here is a uh, CF or cumulative distribution function of the biological condition scores using over e for this for California streams um, and here we have a cube stream stream length. So and this relationship between these two is what we use to uh, do our, our, our condition assessment. So remember that the mean of the reference for over E is 1. So we usually pick um, an impairment threshold of 1 and a half standard deviations below that and one at three, so one and a standard deviation is below that. The, the, you can read this graph. Fifty percent of the stream length in the state has to be biology. And do this a very impaired threshold, then we come up with twenty-three percent being very degraded. So it's the stream length comes from the width from our probability distribution and scores come from our bugs. But it's these numbers then that are assessment for the state. So they're a little easier to present or to think about. Uh, we can convert these into pie charts or other types of graphical displays. Um, here, 50% plus or minus 4% of California streams are in good biological condition, 27%. Uh, in biology and another 23% of very degraded biology. The patterns are, are we find good things in very degraded in all regions of the state. Um, 
you know, because we can also, a nice feature of the design is that we can create regional assessments as well, as well as we have enough sites, we can chop the state up any way we want. Even we could produce assessments by county or by regional board or by uh, watershed. In this case, we're using a, a hybrid. These are essentially, these are major eco regions of the state, and the charts uh, uh, describe the biological condition of different regions. can also, because we included land use as a, as a uh, defining category, we're able to, to make statements about the biological condition of streams that drain agricultural lands, forested lands, urban lands, and, and everything else. In this case, uh, so here, I mean, this is probably a shocking pattern, but uh, agriculture, streams that drain agricultural and urban lands have essentially no streams that are in good biological condition. Another thing we do with these kind of surveys is, is look at um, what we call stressor extent. So the question here is what percent of California streams are affected by high or moderate levels of different types of stress? So what of uh, California streams have uh, high levels of phosphorus or nitrogen, chloride? Et cetera. So, and the bars represent, um, I should say, red bars represent very high levels of phosphorus, and uh, red plus yellow represents uh, ones with at, least, at least moderate levels. So, you would read this by saying about 50% of the stream length in California has some, um, some amount of phosphorus um, issues. Um, Turbidity, not so much. Mines and sands are big issues, um, and so we can we generate these for whatever variables that we have measured at each site, either on site or using GIS um, landscape techniques. Now here's an example of the same thing, just looking at regional assessments. You can see contrasts uh, among the regions in which stressors are are important, or geology at least. Um, and finally, uh, again, by land use, so contrast in which um, which are predominate in different regions or different uh, land use categories of the state. The thing that we can, another thing we like to do or can do with these types of surveys is, this. so I described um, what happened. Stressor extent. Another thing that's interesting that is of interest is if if a stress factor is present at a site, what is that the effect of that on biological conditions? So there's a concept called relative risk, which is borrowed from the medical uh, community. Essentially, you can think of it as the increased risk of biological impairment that's associated with high levels of stress. It's like Nicole advisory is about smoking. You know, you have people that still have a tenfold increase in chance of getting emphysema. So that kind of information can be really helpful in guiding guiding us. So here are some examples from a, a survey in Southern California, looking at, which suggests that percent sands and mines, total phosphorus, channel alteration, many of these physical habitat measures are very associated with biological impairment. This other one, this is, these are the two things I talked about so far, just with some more stressors. Um, stressor extent, so how, how prevalent is it? Relative risk, how much, how um, much is the biology affected when you see it? And here, attributable risk is, is integrates the two. So it's, it's, it sort of weights it. recently because we think it has some value in, in water quality management, is using the information that comes from these surveys to help um, with uh, things, what I'm calling here biology-based stressor thresholds. We have, we have thresholds for various uh, contents uh, in the state, and there, you know, there's different 
driving them, but one, one thing that's not done that often is using the types of survey data we have here to help inform that. And here's this an example of how it could work. So what we're looking at is a scatter plot of the relationship between biological condition scores on the y-axis and little nitrogen. And um, those represent sites that are in good biological condition, um, impaired, very impaired, or degraded, very degraded. And you see time and time again in these patterns, there's, there's a clear, you know, less clear point at which the biology is no longer, uh, you don't see good biology. Good, you don't see intact biology. And the concept is that you could use this information to help inform the, the regulatory uh, standards for these, where the thresholds should be put. So some variables is more amenable to this than others, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a tool that we haven't had before. Um, here's an example of how to do this regionally or calibrate the thresholds regionally. So here, this is fine sediment we're looking at now in different regions of the state and using this, this you can see the, the difference between um, where biology affected by fine sediments in the north is very different in the north coast than it is in the south coast. So, okay, so I want to, I'm getting close here, so I want to wrap, wrap this up by describing the things that we're working on right now. We'll be presenting quite a bit of information over the coming year. So stay tuned. Um, the main things we're working on are, we've, in the last 12 months or so, we put a lot of effort into expanding the, the, the data set. So the, all of the work I've, that I showed you in those figures represents about 400 sites worth of data. The, we now have closer to a, uh, 800 to 1,000 sites worth of data, um, both because say data becoming available now, but also because we've um, made partnerships with some other surveys that have uh, been doing this kind of thing in the state and bring them all together so that we now have a collaborative network of probability data. That was a big effort, but it's pretty exciting. It's finally, finally paying off now. So to give you an idea of what we're talking about, here's a just a list of some of the major surveys that have, have gone on to the state. The top three are the ones that I just described to you. These are the ones that the data came from. Here, the PSA collected another 300 sites. This is the National Rivers and Streams Assessment, which is sort of update to EMAP. Um, and then South Coast, I just covered up my thing. Um, uh, the Star Monitoring Coalition, which represents a, it's a coal node of uh, stakeholders and, and water boards in the uh, south coast of, the, of California, uh, have collaborated and generated about 400 sites worth of data just in that region. So it's a big, big addition to our surveys. Um, our, that's what's done so far. Next, the next reports, we've already combined these now. And this, most of those reports will be based on this larger set, larger set of data. We also have, there are other ones that are scattered out there that are on our radar that we're going to, that I've put in this light blue font. Uh, these are ones that we have targeted but have not yet um, brought into the, brought into the mix, but we hope to soon. There's an uh, effort happening in the Bay Area actually that's of, that's of interest. The regional um, coalition. Is get ready to start their own survey there that we're coordinating with them on. So, okay, that's the side of working with partnerships and expanding the data set is incorporating new um, scoring tools. Part of the bioassessment, bioobjectives process, we're developing new statewide tools that are that are um, that should be more a little bit more precise and more accurate assessments for the state. So we're excited about updating our condition assessments with those. Um, another area of, of interest is going beyond just benthic invertebrates to add um, the program has been working hard to develop the capacity to use algal based bioassessment monitoring. So as that as that um, firms up we'll be pulling uh, we'll be combining 
combining, uh, creating algal condition indicators and then combining them with our benthic invertebrate indicators. So that's a an uh, 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 area of, of work. And also, you know, we, we collect a lot of uh, habitat data, both in human riparian condition data, that we have not yet done a lot with on the condition assessment end. And that will be, we expect to be um, a of that in the coming year. And I showed you a couple examples of regionalizations or how some of these assessments can be done regionally. Uh, we've done them based on those big ecoregions in the state, but we, we think we have enough data now to start producing assessments at the regional board level. So we should have regional um, assessments for different regional boards. We could also do it at a uh, large watershed level, too. Um, another that, that we're working on currently is documenting stressor distribution patterns. So this is the biological assessment that we can describe. We can also look at patterns in um, land activities in watersheds. So for example, um, we can say, what, uh, what is the distribution of road densities upstream of sites in the north coast versus the central coast? We can look at uh, uh, ver uh, various uh, stressors like mines or, um, of course, uh, percent agriculture, percent urbanization, um, things like that we'll be, we'll be reporting on in the month. And then the last one list here is, is something the program is interested in general. We um, haven't made any commitments to extending into non-perennial streams, but we know we know it's a huge area of, of importance to the state. It's really important biologically, and it's, it's virtually unknown, it's undescribed. So it's something that we we expect to expand into. We have, haven't have really made any progress on that yet, so stay tuned on that one. Um, I'll just close here then and just say that probability surveys um, are provide critical perspectives that you can't get from traditional survey designs. But these, the results of these is that they should give you context that will support much more efficient and effective use of monitoring dollars. And there are a number of benefits that go beyond just general consensus sets because the, the generation of those distribution, or the understand what the picture of the underlying distribution of uh, various uh, pollutants and biological condition should be valuable in a lot of different contexts. And so we're, our hope is that this pro this program will continue to produce the, a really large data set that can be mined to meet a lot of different needs. So, and all of this data will be available through, through swamp and seed networks. Um, I will leave it there. I think that's the yep, that's the last slide. So uh, I'll turn it back to. Eric, uh, thanks, thanks to everybody for, for, for joining us. Thank you. At this time, uh, participants, you can send in your questions via chat. You can also unmute your phone, star six, and ask your question. Got about minutes remaining in our session today. Hey, Peter, this is Ken Fetcher with the York Tribe. I got a question. Presentation and that's a that's a great picture on the, the last uh, yeah. slide there as well. I figured you'd like that. <laughs> hey, um, I have a question on one of the slides. You were looking at um, more kind of different, you know, like phosphorus and nitrogen, and then turbidity. And I realized how low turbidity was, and, and you know, I was wondering if the data sets that you guys are using to look at these, these conditions are only collected in the summertime, or if you guys are looking at, you know, year-long data that are allowing you to develop these relationships? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Ken, and and you're absolutely right. These are point-in-time uh, measurements, and they're targeted to, to standardize the collection of the biological information, and so for things like that, I think that that's very likely, um, that's a, a good point, and probably 
detonation for that or something that we should we should think about. Because they are not based on multiple sampling points. Yeah, and that's understandable. That turbidity would be low in the summertime when these surveys typically occur. Right. And so you get you know a, a skewed um, understanding of really what's happening out there by just looking at that. And and I'm curious in your future assessments when you guys are looking at larger data sets, if you guys will be looking at again more you know year-round data, or if it'll be focused more in the you know the spring and summer. Right. No. Uh, again, great question. We we have talked about that and. We've one of the things that we've just doing is adding in a, a portion of the sites doing um, periodic during uh, through the year. So we also aren't going to do that at the full data set, but to get a handle on issues like that, there are a couple other parameters that we measure that have similar. Uh, we we're talking about how to work that in. So doing exactly that, but on a subset of the data. Yeah, definitely challenging. I think you guys' you know analyses are great and really you know interesting, and so you know I understand the challenges doing that. I guess, um, one of the things that I'm thinking too is you know you're talking about perennial streams. Is there any effort to expand these to non-weightable streams or rivers? Yeah, that's, that's a good point too. The original design, the EMAP design, included large rivers and streams, um, so we have some data. On that, uh, we have we made it we made a decision to not do that in the last few years. But we may, as we expand back out again, we may take that on also. Yeah, I would urge you guys to do that, and we'd be interested in participating in in any way possible to share data. Or, you know, we certainly accompanied the EMAP crew in the past years when they surveyed. So now there's a lot of data in the, the Klamath, and I think that's uh, an important. Thing to consider uh, in the state of California. Sure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. For some additional questions. If you have a question that was sent via chat on slide 38, please explain the blue and brown lines and tell us why you put the blue line where you did and tells us. Sure. The brown line represents a, a common regulatory standard um, that's used by EPA. I wouldn't take that one very seriously. For now. But the blue in all of these represents the 90th percentile of the green sites, so which are good biology. So every time, and that's in the next slide as well. So, if you, uh, so it's the 90th percentile of the green. Just the green distribution. Sure. Do we have questions? You can send via chat, or you can unmute your phone. Star six. Are we going to access to this slideshow? On the next web page, you'll be able to download the presentation, and you'll also be able to view it. It's being recorded. Time one more question. Hi, um, this is Jan Dougal. Pete, what's the diagonal line on that same slide? Oh, that's the best linear. Um, okay. Linear. Yeah, best for one. for the entire data set. Yes. Thanks. We have uh, time for one question. There's one chat, Eric. Do you see the one from Olivia Irvin? That's to you. Okay. I can address that if you'd like. Yeah, please. Thank you. So I, I, there's a question coming through from Olivia Irvin. And says, you mentioned that the data from CRAM was recently added. Is CRAM as an indicator for estimates or other? Please elaborate. So CRAM has been part of PSA for the last four years. Uh, in fact, a little bit in, in, in the previous project. CRAM is used both as a, we intend CRAM as both an indicator of biological condition itself, because it's an assessment of riparian condition, so riparian uh, health. But we do, there are components of CRAM that would um, explanatory variables. 
principles for explaining biological or other biological condition measures. So we'll be doing both. 